Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, and as this House will be aware, the Northern Ireland Executive has decided to introduce tighter restrictions to break the chains of infection of COVID-19. These measures were detailed in a written statement to members, which I issued following last Thursday's executive meeting, and they take effect uh, from first thing this Friday morning for two weeks. In summary, we will in large part revert to the lockdown situation that applied earlier this year during the first surge of the pandemic. The major difference is that schools will remain open. I will set out in this oral statement the rationale for our new restrictions, um, and in summary, they are essential to prevent the further spike in infections overwhelming our hospitals. The onus is now on all of us to strictly follow public health advice and comply with both the letter and the spirit of the tightened restrictions. We can each play a part in saving lives and preventing avoidable deaths. Uh, that's how serious this is, Mr. Speaker, and that's how high the stakes are. As a society, we can now look forward to 2021 with some optimism. Given the progress towards mass vaccination, I do not want to have to look a grieving relative in the eye next year and say, yes, we could have taken action before Christmas, and that would have saved your loved one's life. I do not want to have to say to them, I am sorry that we did not intervene. I am sorry they are not here with us to enjoy these better days. I would today make a heartfelt plea for unity around this Assembly Chamber. The public are watching and are looking to us for united leadership. It is, of course, the duty of this chamber to hold the executive to account and to scrutinise policy decisions without fear or favour. That is this Assembly's job. There are strong and legitimate opinions and feelings which have run high. However, that does not mean we have to descend into party political point scoring. This is far too important an issue for that. The last few weeks have not seen devolution at its best. That is something of an understatement. Frustration and anger are widespread. Mr. Speaker, we could spend hours in this chamber ragging over the decisions that were made and not made. I have made my own views known both inside and outside the executive. Nevertheless, I fail to see where another bout of division and recrimination will get us now. What good will it do? Whose cause? Will it serve? We could also spend hours pointing fingers about years of underfunding of health and social care, years of underinvesting in staff. Again, what would that achieve today? I trust that everyone in this House is united in wanting the new restrictions to work. We have to give our hospitals and our heroic staff some vital breathing space. If we successfully drive down infection rates, we have the opportunity of a better Christmas. It won't be a normal festive season by any means, but we all have the power to help change the atmosphere. We can do that by abiding by the new restrictions and strictly following public health advice. I would urge all members to promote public health messaging at every opportunity. Please do not undermine it. Undermine it. Please choose your words carefully, both inside and outside this House, today and in coming days and weeks. Let us remember that many countries, including near neighbours and indeed larger swathes of Europe, are currently in lockdown. This includes countries with different health services to our own. So we should not kid ourselves that we are so special or so unique that we can avoid similarly tough decisions. We cannot simply wish this virus away. Mr. Speaker, the paper I presented to the Executive last week made the case for strengthening restrictions in light of the path the pandemic is taking. With schools open and existing restrictions in place, the R rate had settled at around 1 by last week. That meant we had reached uh, approximate equilibrium with regard to community transmission of the virus. There has been a sustained reduction in cases per day since the onset of restrictions. But numbers of cases, admissions, hospital inpatients, ICU occupancy and deaths remain at a relatively high level. In particular, hospital inpatients are at a higher level than was reached in have 1 and have been declining only very slowly. As a cons consequence, the hospital system and staff remain under serious pressure. By last week, we were on the verge of permitting a significant relaxation 
of COVID restrictions. It was highly likely that this was, would have resulted in the R rate rising significantly above 1, with a subsequent increase in cases, admissions, inpatients and ICU occupancy in December. This increase in transmission would have been occurring from a relatively high baseline, meaning an already serious situation would rapidly become much worse. Without a devices and intervention, the hospital system would be at a risk of becoming overwhelmed in mid to late December. To care for the increasing number of critically ill COVID patients, we would have been forced to halt some or even all planned activity for other conditions, some of which would be urgent in nature. We would be facing the prospect of significant increase in both COVID and non-COVID deaths. In such circumstances, it is also likely that even a full lockdown beginning around the 14th of December would have been insufficient to prevent the current levels of hospital pressure being significantly exceeded. Mr Speaker, that is the bleak picture the Executive was faced with last week. That is the context for the lengthy and difficult decisions that we had. I know members will want to ask if there were other measures that could have been deployed. The reality is that, given our current position and the rates of transmission, there are no feasible alternatives. As I have already stated, other countries with different health services to ours have arrived at the same conclusion during the second surge in Europe. There has been considerable interest in the potential of rapid mass testing to reduce the transmission of this virus. However, it is important to recognise that this is largely based on theoretical considerations, and there is yet has been as yet no clear demonstration anywhere in the world that mass testing can significantly reduce transmission in a short period against the background of a high level of community transmission. Modelling suggests that repeated mass testing of most of the population would, would be required to maintain control of transmission by this means, and that would mean a very high degree of population buy-in and would present huge logistical challenges. Both Slovakia and Liverpool have required military logistical support to deliver their programmes and at least a two-week run-in period before the testing was implemented. It remains unclear whether the required number of tests would be available to us in Northern Ireland. However, I have written to and spoke to the Secretary of State for Health, Matt Hancock, to request uh, 4 million rapid lateral flow devices, device tests for Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, I want to see us playing a pivotal role in the UK pilot on mass testing. My ambition is evident, and at the same time, it needs to be remembered that we are still at the stage of pilot programmes. These will help us assess the effectiveness and accuracy of rapid testing technologies. Reliance on mass testing alone would represent a high-risk approach in the run-up to Christmas. It may not be viable for logistical or test supply reasons. And, but there may be scope to target more limited mass testing to high-risk areas. This would be of help, but again would not avoid the need for Northern Ireland-wide restrictions at this time. Mass testing is an exciting development, and together with a vaccine, it offers great hope of a way out of our nightmare. But it is not a panacea, and certainly not at this time, and certainly not without restrictions in place before Christmas. Enhancing hospital capacity is also cited in some quarters as the answer. In theory, measures to increase hospital capacity would allow an increased epidemic level to be managed without a further lockdown. However, this would inevitably be associated with increased death and might be limited by the need of staff to self-isolate as a consequence of healthcare-related outbreaks in hospitals or clusters and outbreaks in the community. It is also the case that the associated levels of community transmission will inevitably result in further significant increase in outbreaks in care homes among extremely vulnerable older people, as was experienced in the first wave, which will result in excess death in the population. However, for practical purposes, it is simply not possible to increase hospital capacity in the short to medium term, because the key factor here is the supply of staff. And given the specialist skill set required, there is a very long lead time for this. While some marginal gains in capacity can be made 
in specific areas such as ICU, this comes at the cost of reduced capacity elsewhere in the system, and it involves the redeployment of existing staff. In addition, Mr. Speaker, when doubling times of cases are in the region of seven to, day, seven to ten days, even a doubling of hospital capacity, where, where that achievable, would buy only a limited period of relief before intervention was required. It is, of course, important to give our people hope as we face into this most difficult of winters. There are real grounds for optimism, given the progress in vaccines, the development of rapid testing and improvements in treatments. But I also need to be candid with the public. I will not offer false hope or pretend that there are shortcuts available to get us through these next few months. We all have to hunker down and play our part, abiding by restrictions, staying at home, working at home where possible, cutting our contacts, keeping our distance, wearing a face covering and washing our hands. We can do that. Mr Speaker, we must do that. The, restric the restrictions that start on Friday will make a difference. We all have to play our part in making them work, and that includes everyone in this chamber, by our words and by our deeds. The Executive uh, must now put the last few weeks behind it, because these are extremely difficult decisions. Governments around the world are grappling with the same awful dilemmas, but we need a collective spirit and a unified purpose, not just in this chamber, but across our society. Everyone across Northern Ireland must do their bit. We can help change the course of this pandemic. We can help save lives. Hope is on the horizon, and a happier new year stands before us. So let us do all we can to make sure as many of us as possible get to enjoy, which will be a much better time in 2021. Okay, and I call Colm Gillerney, Chairperson of the Committee for Health. Thank you to the Minister for coming to make this statement today and also for discussing the statement this morning with myself and the Deputy Chair of the Committee. Um, and to acknowledge the, the, uh, the efforts that staff uh, are, under, are facing at the present time in terms of dealing with the pandemic. But could I ask you, Minister, uh, when did you first bring these restrictions to the Executive on closing non-essential retail and or the closure of hospitality? Um, to, to answer the Committee Chair, it was a paper that was presented to the Executive um, for the Executive meeting on Thursday. I think it was circulated two days before or a day before as is, as normal practice. Sorry, I apologise to the Chair. It was circulated the night before, specifically, because that's when the paper was finalised and circulated to two executive members. Uh, before the executive met, that following morning, I'm led to believe the BBC had it before the executive had uh, the opportunity to, to actually discuss it. And Mr Speaker, while I'm on that point, I think I do want to make the point that one of the things that is challenging about the decisions that our executive makes in regards to being a five-party executive is only enhanced and amplified by the fact that there seems to be a running commentary that comes from the executive to the media and multiple strains of the media as well, which makes it why we should be having those challenging, difficult decisions within what should be a closed space for those discussions are transcribed and transmitted very often through social media before the conversation is actually finished. So whoever it is and whatever, whatever avenue provides that information out of the executive is not helping the cause that we try to achieve by coming to a united purpose. And I call Palm Cameron. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the statement to the House um, this morning. And we certainly don't um, underestimate the, the, the job of work the executive has to do in making these very difficult decisions. For practical purposes, it is simply not possible to increase hospital capacity in the short to medium term. And the key factor here is the supply of staff, as we know. And given the special skill set required, there is a very long lead-in time for this. What is the lead-in time for training staff? And was eight months between the first wave and now not enough to increase staff numbers? And has the workforce appeal not um, achieved um, the additional staff members that, that may help out in the, this next uh, through this wave? Um, 
by supplying those key staff that are actually required. Okay, I, I thank the member from her, for her point, and I think something that so often gets confused in the timeline when we, we talk about this, we have, as you know, it's eight months from the first, it's eight months, nine months, sorry. February was our first case of COVID in Northern Ireland, so it's really nine months since we had that case. We've been through a wave, we've been through that first pandemic, which lasted for months. We've really only seen that return to, to even a, 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 a glimmer of normality in July or August where our staff were already overwhelmed, over-exhausted, and at a point where they needed that break. So to be able to train an ICU nurse and an anaesthetist doctor or anyone in a short space of months is not, not practical or not, or not possible. And I'm sure many of, of the, the colleges who register their professionals would make that same point. In regards to, to the workforce appeal, we have launched again in the second approaching this second phase, uh, a more targeted approach for those skill sets um, that we, we do need. As of last week, we had received 3,157 applications, and as of today, 500, or sorry, as of last week, 516 of those are either tentative job ready, offered, or actually appointed. Um, 600, over 600 have actually been rejected as not meeting the skill set or, or, or being a, applicable for, for the position they used. So there is that balance of the workforce appeal actually working, but to try to get an increase of, of the highly professional skills that we do need, which is the ICU nurse, the anaesthetist and the respiratory ward um, professionals, it's not possible to do that in that period of time. And we're seeing that, we're seeing that across all jurisdictions. Um, I think we're actually seeing where parts of England and Wales can't now open where their Nightingale facilities because they are in the position where they don't have the skilled workforce as well. They have the premises, but they don't have the staff. And I said, you know, as I said earlier on, and I've said many times, Mr Speaker, when, when we come back, when this place come back on the 11th of January, one of the achievements, one of the collective achievements was that agreement of investing in our health workforce. We put in an, an additional 300 nursing training places per year over the next three years. But, Mr Speaker, it takes a long time for them to come through, it takes a number of years for them to come through that basic training, never mind getting to the enhanced skill set that we actually need to operate in our ICUs and our anaesthetists and all that additional workforce as well. So our workforce really are stepping up at this moment in time, and I think it's incumbent on us to give them as much support as we possibly can. I call Colin McGrath. Speaker, and I welcome the uh, cohesive tone that's contained in the statement today, and I hope that all executive ministers can pick up on that tone uh, and use it. Last week was an embarrassment to us all, uh, and not of our making in here as MLAs, but to have faith in the message, we must have faith in the messengers. Could I ask the Minister um, what avenue the Department uh, is taking to explore how to better detail the public message? Families are really concerned about Christmas and they want to know exactly what they can and cannot do, uh, and they would need to know that soon. So, would the Minister have a sense of how that message will be detailed to the public? Um, and I, again, I thank the member. Um, one of the things, one of the messages um, I, th I think comes from Christmas. And it's not simply about the following family gatherings. It's about that of hope, of faith, uh, and of belief. And I think that's where the message um, we need to be betraying um, for, that, for this Christmas. Um, but how we do that collectively, um, I was involved in, in a meeting on, on Saturday with uh, the, the Chancellor of the, the Duchy of Lancaster, our own First and Deputy First Ministers, the First Minister of Scotland, and the First Minister of Wales and a number of Chief Medical Officers as to how we get what we do um, at Christmas, the same across these islands. And I was, I was glad as well that there was an ongoing conversation as well between, between Her Majesty's Government in London and, and the Irish Government as well to make sure that we come to a collective message across these islands, uh, whereas we can ensure that families get as much um, continuity of message, especially at that time. But I think one of the messages that we, we should be taking for that of Christmas is one of hope uh, and encouragement and that of faith and trust as well, because that's what we need to be, to be instilling. It's the message that we need to be putting out, that our executive needs to be putting out on a, on a unified voice, that this assembly needs to be putting out through a unified voice, and that our people need to be hearing that 
although times are tough and they will be tough over the next couple of weeks, with everything that comes, there is a new dawn coming and it will be coming sooner if we can all work together. I call Alan Chambers. I came across uh, something on social media uh, written by a doctor in the United States of America that caught my eye. He said, we as health care workers are not your frontliners anymore. We are your last line of defence. You, the public, are the frontliners now. The war has shifted to the community, and it is up to you. This cannot be won in the confines of the hospital. Would the minister agree that these are wise words that we all need to pay heed to and reflect in all our actions and indeed our words, especially those of us who serve in this House? Thank you. Um, I, I thank the member for, for his comment. Um, I, I don't spend a lot of time on, on social media at, uh, at, at the current pre premises or current current time, but that message, I think, is one that is accurate. This, um, we, we fight this, this virus now um, in our streets, in our shops, in our homes, um, and that is where, where we have seen the, those transmissions um, actually taking place. So it is the, the ask that I make as Health Minister, but it is the ask that I make on behalf of our health service, the same as that doctor is making. You know, if we encourage the people of Northern Ireland to come together, to work together, to break those chains of infection by following the messaging that we have consistently put out, you know, social distancing, good hand hygiene, good respiratory hygiene, wearing a face covering, reducing your number of contacts as much as possible, we can break those chains of infection, which leads to the hospital admissions, which leads to the ICU admissions as well. So the message that that healthcare worker put out it may have come from America. But I'm sure it would be echoed and replicated from any healthcare worker across any facility that is currently combating COVID-19. Call Paula Bradshaw. From today, um, weekly testing of domiciliary care workers will be beginning in England. Are you minded to replicate that here in Northern Ireland? Thank you. Um, as the as the increase in capacity comes through through your mass testing programme, it is something we are considering. Yes. Call Jonathan Buckley. Please be assured this question is not political but indeed personal, as I'm sure it is for many members. The Minister's statement says, I don't want to have to look a grieving relative in the eye next year and say that yes, we could have taken action before Christmas that would have saved a loved one's life. Sadly, I found myself doing that this week, and not in relation to COVID, but in relation to cancer. A GP for North Antrim wrote to me on Saturday saying, in our bid to manage COVID, we have unleashed a tsunami of other medical problems into what is already a crippled service. It is now broken, and I don't see how that can change. As we tell our patients with potential cancer, I'm sorry it will be six months before you can see a consultant for diagnosis and treatment, and it gets, harder, it gets a harder job every day. What grieves me most is that what has been missed during the lockdown period in relation to the problems that it causes. The Register for General Quarterly Statistics showed that cancer deaths to date is 3,490. Minister, can you give an update to the House about the re-establishment or the establishment of a regional cancer reset, reset cell to oversee resumption of cancer services to place patients uh, some certainty in the days ahead? You know, and um, I, I thank the member for his question, and I know in no way as a political guy, I received the same, the same email um, myself, and I'm sure the member is well aware I received many emails uh, from our healthcare professionals, from families, from individuals who find themselves exactly um, in that same situation. But while we are expanding and expanding our, our health service resource combating COVID, that is where the, the, the challenges come to meet those, the needs of those non-COVID patients. That is why we published our, our surge plans, that is why we published our rebuilding plans, and that is why I announced, as the member rightly refers to, that cancer reset cell is how it can actually approach um, how we can deliver cancer services on a regional basis rather than simply by, by trust basis. Um, the work of that cell is ongoing as to how we, we can bring together the operations um, and the diagnostics and the care pathways 
they were operating uh, across trusts on an, almost not in silos. That's that's not the, the correct term, but they were operating on on trust basis rather than across the whole whole of Northern Ireland. So I'm certainly able, and I will look forward to providing an update as to the specifics of the outworkings of that cancer reset cell once I receive them. I don't have them with me today, but I will get them for the member and also speak or update the rest of the House as to how that work is progressing. Because it's crucial that we we allow our health care staff to look after the patients of Northern Ireland and the care and provide the care that they need. We do that by ensuring, ensuring uh, that they don't have to look after more COVID patients. We do that by following and abiding uh, the regulations that are coming forward from this Friday so that we break those rates of transmission, so that many of our healthcare professionals can get back in and working on the specialities that they've trained to do, the areas of their expertise, and can provide about the best healthcare system that we can. The, the member referred to, um, to, to the email he received, and it talked about a, a crippled service. Um, I, I don't disagree with it. Uh, our health service has been long under stress and strain um, for many years, but we have a number of things in place that will see it rebuild, we rebuild better, not go back to the way it was, because I think that would be actually a detriment if we allowed our health service to simply go back to where it was. And that's why I welcome, uh, when we did come back in January, that executive commitment that our health service would be a priority, as would be the people who need it, but also the people who work in it. I call Orlea Flynn. Good, can call you and uh, Garmi, I'll get to the Minister for today's statement. Um, just similar to um, another member's question, um, I would like to ask the Minister in the statement it mentions, so the four million, um, the request has been put in for four million um, rapid testing devices. And if the Minister could detail um, a bit more just how the Department um, plans to roll those tests out. I don't know if you're thinking more towards uh, population-wide testing or maybe to target, um, try and target more high-risk groups like the car homes and the meat plants, etc. Thank you. No, and I, I, I thank the, the member for, for, her, for her question. In regards to the four million, that would allow us to do the entirety of, of the population. Um, that would be a, a massive logistical challenge. Um, this morning I actually attended Queen's University in, in Belfast, who are running out one of our first mass testing initiatives, uh, where they've already set up in the Whitla Hall. Uh, their, I, their, their intention is to be able to do 6,000 tests per day by the end of the week, which is, is highly ambitious, but it will allow us to, to work out how um, that would actually look and how mass testing would would, would deliver uh, what we wanted to deliver. We have been involved at a department level in regards to what's been happening in Liverpool, uh, the outworkings of it, whereas the wider mass testing uh, of the population maybe isn't just bringing forward the results that many would have hoped. So in regards to the members' questions, would we look at a more or are we looking at a more uh, targeted interventions when it comes to mass testing? We are in regards to uh, trying that initiative in one of our trusts and in care homes as well, so that we put, put those testing devices, while they are still limited in number, while they are still new, to the best, uh, best use and best purpose, uh, where we can identify those who are asymptomatic, those who are testing positive for COVID, so that we can get the best support put in places as well. But I must say what I saw in, in Queen's um, this morning in that collaborative piece on mass testing it was impressive as to how they had actually interacted with our test trace and protect system as well, so that a, a test positive case there, which can come forward um, in a matter of hours, were, was already being contacted by the test trace and protect system uh, as well to make sure that they're fully, lo uh, fully logged in to the entirety of our support programme. I call Tom Buchanan. Uh, Mr Speaker, Minister. Based on the modelling that the health service uses over the past four weeks, we have seen restrictions that has been in place, and obviously that has not worked, and that the error factor has increased. It has not dropped to the level that uh, was expected. Now, can I ask the Minister then, at the end of this two-week lockdown that is being brought in, what plans he has in place should the error factor still be sitting at 0.8 or 0.9? What plans has he got in place to ensure that there will be no further extension of the lockdown? Uh, 
uh, to allow our businesses to open, and especially our churches, the closure of our churches was, was a retrograde step. Um, and again, you know, the member makes, makes the point in regards to our four-week intervention uh, didn't have the, the complete desired effect that we, we thought it would have. Where we did see our decrease in the first two, two and a half weeks uh, when schools were closed, unfortunately when schools reopened again, we did see that increase starting to go back up again. The executive policy, as, as stated uh, back in the meeting in May, was to keep our at or below one, where we're actually seeing a continual decrease in the number of positive cases um, in Northern Ireland. But I think what was really the, the deciding factor uh, for the executive on Thursday was when we saw the number of hospital admissions that we did see. Um, the two-week intervention that we are bringing in now on the 27th of November, which takes us through, through to December, uh, the severity of it, the, the depth of it, should get us to a point uh, where we're seeing those rates of transmission really driven down, but also allows our hospitals that breathing space where it allows them to, to discharge a number of the COVID patients that already in there. And as, as I said in my statement, the next steps are those initiatives that are coming. They, they, they are at advanced stage when it comes to mass testing, when it comes to even, even to this morning again, the announcement of another vaccine. So that will be three three vaccines that are approach, approaching that level um, of being, in regards anywhere to 70, 80, 90 per cent, effective. It's all stages like that. It's all asking the general public to engage with us again when these restrictions do end on, on the 11th of December. They are time limited to that because of the severity that they do. And I, I, I thank the executive, my executive colleagues um, for supporting the asks that were made because they are dramatic, uh, and they are, and will have um, an effect on, on the general public of Northern Ireland and, and of our businesses. And Mr Speaker, um, um, you made reference to a second uh, executive uh, announcement after this, after this one in regards to those support packages. Uh, I'm looking forward to that as well, because I left the executive meeting to come here, so I hope they are as beneficial to the people and the businesses of Northern Ireland as the BBC seems to already know they are. Can I call Pat Sheehan? Good to come, Cor Logos, Buica Selecionara, Hassan Rachel Shore, Majin. Thank the, the Minister for this uh, statement this morning. And uh, these uh, restrictions, new restrictions, were absolutely necessary. It's a pity they hadn't been implemented uh, a bit sooner. However, we are where we are. Uh, but it's important that those who need financial support uh, during these restrictions receive it and receive it quickly. But could I uh, ask the Minister that in October there was an announcement that £27 million would be made available to care homes for the care partnership uh, arrangements. Could the Minister confirm that none of that funding has yet made its way into care homes? Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, and I thank the member. Um, I did announce uh, there was a new £27 million funding package for the care home sector. Uh, the funding was to support care homes to continue paying staff as well at 80 per cent of their salary when on sick leave for COVID-19 related reasons. Uh, that measure was first announced in June and was then extended to the end of the 2021 financial year. The £27 million funding package is in addition to previously announced support packages and includes financial support for testing and visiting to recognise some of the additional management time needed to respond to COVID-19. It is widely accepted that there was a fine balance which had to be achieved on care home visiting, and I am very conscious of the extreme pressures on homes. Um, but I also want to see their door. I don't want to see their door totally closed to visits, and I was hopeful that the new funding package was to facilitate those visits to the immense benefit of residents and their families. Uh, the way the funding package works, uh, other expenditure can be claimed back by homes on a number of grounds, which included the support for additional staffing, for instance, because of more acutely unwell residents or the need to support individuals who were self-isolating and also for blood booking um, regency staff, the continuing with enhanced cleaning, support for changes to the physical environment, and that was to include the support for safe visiting. Um, trusts um, will, are, were provided with funds to administer applications to this fund in a regionally coordinated and consistent way. 
and there will be ongoing work with the sector to ensure there is clear guidance on what can be claimed and a streamlined and efficient process for administering applications. So it's about those care homes actually making claims to the trusts uh, for expenditure that they have incurred rather than a, a, a front-up payment. Thank you for your statement today, Minister. And I'm really worried about the mental health implications of, of uh, the, the restrictions on terms of church goers, congregations, uh, publicans, business owners, and their families. That said, Minister, what is the impact of the constant uh, sniping from the sidelines about the decisions made in this House by other parties, ministers, and by other parties? And in terms of the unity of message, and it's very, very easy for us to all say we're going to have a unified, positive message coming from this House. How difficult is that for the, the business owners who are on their knees, who need help? It's easy for us all up here to, to quote another elected representative, we're all well healed. How important is it that the grants are forthcoming quickly from the Department for the Economy the Department for Finance to encourage the adherence to the guidelines and restrictions? I thank the member. Um, for a statement. And look, unity is, and the unity of message, I think, is important. Um, we have one enemy. We have one united enemy, and that's COVID-19. And I've been consistent in my message and, uh, and my position since I, I've taken up the, the role of health minister um, in this pandemic. Has there been opportunities when I could have scored political points? There's been many. Have I? No. Because I do not believe that is how I would be best served in this position, supporting the people of Northern Ireland who need health care, but also supporting our health care workers as well. So what I will say to the member uh, as well, be careful that he doesn't get drawn into the trap of others by criticising their political messaging and their political sniping, by making political messages and engaging in political sniping. It's too easy. It's far too easy. The difficult messages are the ones that we have been consistently repeating about how we combat this virus. Good social distancing, good hand hygiene, good respiratory hygiene, wearing face coverings, and um, breaking and reducing the number of contacts that you have in a day and a week. In regards to the, the support mechanisms and the financial support mechanisms uh, for not just businesses but also for individuals, um, as the Speaker has indicated, the Finance Minister will be making another statement to this House, which I will support him on. Call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Restrictions are not only uh, to help save lives, but to protect uh, non-COVID activity within the NHS. So, Minister, can you confirm that result of the surge plan that uh, activity in non-COVID non elected surgery has continued at a much higher level than the previously? And also, the public can play their part in ensuring that our ambulance service and our action and emergency units do not become uh, overwhelmed, so that, irrespective of what someone is suffering from, they can receive treatment uh, from our hospital services. Um, and again, I, I thank the member. There was a, a, a specific uh, urgent role on surge planning last week, uh, where I addressed some of the, the misconceptions in regards to the detail of work. Uh, that had already been taken by not just my department, but all six of our trusts, and that includes our, our ambulance service as well. But the, the point that the member makes is, is the main one, uh, and that while our hospital and our care system are supporting COVID patients, those are uh, beds, those are support mechanisms, those are specialists and specialities um, that are being taken up uh, elsewhere, and also the skill set that is, is being used. Um, to give the member sorry, an indication of where we are in regards to the work that our surge plans um, have done, and Mr Speaker, I will compare where we are um, in, in October as the last verified numbers to where we were uh, in April. In regards to three main areas, which is new outpatient activity, the review outpatient activity, and in procedure daycare activity as well. In April 2020, we conducted over those three headings uh, in region of 57,000 uh, procedures. In October uh, 2020, where we still had a degree of, or an increased degree and an increased support of COVID patients, that figure had went up to 98,500. So nearly, near, nearly over 40% again on the areas of those expertise, while still 
uh, looking after a high number of COVID patients because of the work that was not put in place by the department and by the trusts and by individual uh, care pathways of how they could support their own patients while also dealing with an increase in COVID patients as well. Carl William Humphrey. Thank you, Minister, for his answer so far. And he is right. There are difficult decisions that ministers, all ministers, have to take uh, around this hugely serious issue. Apart from worship and prayer, many people attend church for solace and comfort. There is real anger and anxiety out there. And the decision taken to close churches. Why was the decision taken to close churches, Minister? Despite steps taken by churches right across Northern Ireland in terms of PPE and equipment that was purchased, and what was the evidence given for that closure? Um, I will thank the member um, for his question because, as he knows and as he be fully aware, there are decisions that are, have been brought forward to me as Minister that I do not take easily or, or lightly. Um, in regards to, to his specific question, uh, we did see through contact tracing uh, a number of outbreaks and a number of incidents related specifically to churches. But what was very clear also from what was put forward from our Chief Scientific Advisor and the Chief Medical Officer was in regards to the data that was provided through those who had um, contacted COVID but also where they had been when it came to giving the information to your test traders and protect system. Those who attended church were more open about where they had been and more upfront in regards to, to the locations that they had been. So the, I suppose it was pointed out that there was a number of incidents through churches. But look, I, I've had the conversation uh, with the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor, um, and I would still be supportive of the reopening of places of worship um, for acts of private worship, provided that social distancing and, and hard surface hygiene guidance were followed and that face coverings uh, were used. Because I do believe it is important at this time that people are given the opportunity even to pay in private um, if that should be their wish to do so, but also to value the, 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 the power of prayer, that it also doesn't matter where it's done, it's the act and the belief in doing it. Call Liz Cummins. I can thank the Minister for his statement this morning. Um, I think it's, it's widely recognised and acknowledged the role of carers in our society. Um, both, both pre-COVID and I think it's being further emphasised throughout uh, this pandemic. Um, and I suppose the, the restrictions have had an even uh, bigger impact on the support networks to carers, uh, both on a statutory level and in their own informal settings. With that said, we have seen the monies um, provided for care homes and for domiciliary care, um, as mentioned by previous uh, speakers. Is the Minister considering a one-off grant payment for uh, unpaid and informal carers um, based on this and, I suppose, the increased role they have had throughout the pandemic? And I thank the member, and it has been something. The, the role of our, our carers um, has been one that has been highlighted many times um, in this House, um, not least by Ms, Ms, Mrs Armstrong as well, who has been, who's usually been um, their, their advocate of before now, as of many other members in this House. Uh, the advice document that was specifically de developed for carers and young carers uh, was first published and available on the, the 10th of April. Uh, an additional funding of 500000 was provided to trusts via the Health and Social Care Board to allow for direct payment flexibility uh, to be introduced. That option is still there. There is, um, we have not put forward yet a bid for additional payments for carers or, or, or the support networks that, that has been asked for. But I am aware that the, the Minister of Communities uh, has made specific funding bids in regards to what the Minister of Finance uh, may announce uh, later after this, not one to preempt anything, that would provide additional financial supports uh, for those in receipts of some benefits. Paul Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And it will not come as the Health Minister's surprise when I ask him more about carers. Um, and I thank very much the previous member's question. It was one I was going to ask. But, uh, Minister, I am going to ask you very clearly. Um, we still have carers across Northern Ireland. 
whether they receive extra payment or not, are exhausted. And I'm asking, um, I'm pleading with you now to please go back to your trusts and to ask them what supports are going to be made available over Christmas for those carers before we end up putting more pressure and more challenges into the health service by the breakdown of those older carers and carers, most of whom are women, um, who are at breaking point. And that's not an exaggeration. Um, I've had people in tears um, who cannot cope any further. They are working 24-7 and they are exhausted, can you please confirm that there will be something done with the Trust to make sure that there is equitable provision across Northern Ireland to support our carers in the run-up and over Christmas? Um, and, and again, I thank the member because I do know the passion and personal experience that, that she brings to this. I'm, and I am fully aware of the challenges that are faced uh, by our service users, the carers and the families actually throughout this pandemic. And even in regards to something the member has raised as well, with me specifically the impact on day centres um, and, and the, those closures and when she talks about equality across the region because daycare centres provide valuable opportunities uh, for people to reach their full potential but also provide that respite for those with the caring um, responsibilities. So back in July uh, the Trust restarted that daycare day centre provisioning line with the public health guidelines and the member will be aware there are significant barriers in restoring full-time provision, but ensuring the safety of service users, families and carers is also paramount. But I appreciate you know, the frustration that is felt in this House by service users, by parents and carers that day centre provision is not yet available at the levels where they were accessible pre-COVID, which does bring about that respite. Um, my officials are closely working with the Health and Social Care Board and the Trust to identify ways to increase that, that day centre provision. But in the interim, services are continually monitored and assessed, so the service uptake and those unfilled spaces are reallocated where possible to do so as quickly as post possible. And the line to this process, trusts have been working with families and again community colleagues to, to scope out what are additional but also alternative supports, should that be from direct payments uh, and domiciliary and those respite options. Um, however, as I'm sure you can appreciate, we can only progress to full service within day centres when it is, is safe to do so. I call Paul Given. First, let me register an interest with the family members that are uh, working in the National Health Service, and I pay tribute to those in the Health Service for the work uh, that they are uh, doing. We all share the same objective uh, to minimise the number of deaths, but there is difference as to how best we can do that. On the evening, the announcement was made of further restrictions by the executive. A friend of mine responsible for hundreds of members of staff rang me to say a vulnerable person in their employment who they knew through the isolation at home was vulnerable, putting in measures to assist, took her own life, and they put it down as a result of the lockdown measures. So we all want to minimise deaths. In reaching decisions that the executive is taking around uh, restricting people's movement, uh, seeking to contain where they can go and what they can do. What analysis is the executive taking and this department that leads the executive on these policy decisions around the behaviour of the public and how they respond? Because we all have had scenes over the weekend of the queues outside multiple retailers right across Northern Ireland, the spike in that contact as a result of the decision that was taken. And the decision that is being taken on churches is putting people of faith into an impossible position where they are conflicted with their allegiance to a higher authority than civil authority. Is the minister saying that he will continue to enforce lockdown and only allow solitary prayer as opposed to public acts of worship, where in my church, for instance, can easily accommodate, question, can easily accommodate over 100 people properly socially distanced and churches that take responsibility very seriously. Is he saying that he is going to continue to recommend that those churches to have to stay closed? Um, in, in regards to the member's last point and in regards to the interaction that uh, the executive through the junior ministers have had with the leaders of the churches, I think they all recognise the responsibility they bring and the challenges that they do have as well in regards to to follow in this advice and, and guidance as well, but in regards to, to how we manage, um, manage COVID as well. Because these are not, as the member knows, easy decisions. 
They have not been easy decisions, nor for me and my own, but also for some of the members' colleagues within the executive. Uh, and that is where those conversations have been had. So it's not about restricting anyone's freedom of worship or freedom of prayer. And I'm, I'm disappointed the member would even try to put that allegation towards me as an individual, because it's not in, in my keeping. But in regards to the analysis of behaviours, one of the things that does make it increasingly challenging for any health message that does come out either from my department or from the executive is for those who seem intent on undermining it by their words or their actions or have done in the past. Because once you see that, it makes it harder for, for any individual um, to actually follow that advice and guidance in good faith. But I would welcome, and I do welcome, the statements that have come out uh, from our churches and religious leaders in regards to where they see the difficult decisions that have been made uh, by the executive as we once again try to bring the spread of COVID-19 under control. We'll bring on the next speaker. Would it remain, members, just to please keep your remarks very, very brief. Get to your question. We have a number of members here who do wish to ask questions. And I call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement. Minister, just briefly, uh, I'd ask that you and members of this House join with me in offering your condolences to the family of Breach and Owen Ward, husband and wife who died 12 hours apart last Wednesday, who died as a result of this virus. It's completely devastating uh, for that family and for the entire community to watch uh, su such a painful loss. Uh, Minister, in relation to uh, the uh, restrictions uh, in place, there is a huge amount of concern amongst uh, the uh, teaching profession and indeed parents uh, in relation to schools remaining open. I am wondering, Minister, given the spread of this virus and given that we need to take every possible step to prevent its spread now in the mouth of Christmas, what conversations have you, you had, Minister, with the Minister of Education uh, in relation to the early closure of schools to ensure that we can enter Christmas as safely as possible and to ensure teachers have a period of isolation prior to meeting with their loved ones, if possible? And I thank the member. You know, um, and I think we've all seen um, some of those heartbreaking stories um, come forward in regards to those who have lost their lives um, due, COVID, due to COVID. But there are many other stories that we don't hear or don't see, but they're, they're equally as tragic and equally as hurtful to many a family who, who will have a, an empty chair or a number of empty chairs around the table um, come, come this Christmas. So we do pass those, my condolences on to all, all those families who have lost, lost loved ones as well. And I've said before, Speaker, that I think one of the hardest reports that I have ever read and still continue to read is that daily report that gives us the, the number of positive cases on the number of deaths, because behind each one of those numbers as a family is also an individual as well. In regards to, to the specifics of, of education, um, there has been an assessment made and a conversation had within the executive of the importance of education and continuing our young people's education as, as much as is, is practical and is safe to do so. Um, one of the decisions, one of the conversations, uh, mostly has been regard to, to that early intervention of schools and bringing forward school holidays by a week. Um, and I suppose one of the points that has been made and has been listened to that um, when schools are closed, if there's not an adequate provision for young people to enact in, it's where they actually end up as well. So they could end up being uh, in a worse situation when it comes to the spread of COVID rather than being in their own places of education. Uh, the Chief Scientific Advisor, I think, has indicated that the opening of, of schools, because we were, during the four weeks that we had, the only difference uh, we saw between the first two weeks and the second two weeks was the opening of schools. And where we did see our increase, um, it isn't solely attributable to what happened in the classroom, but associated through schools. And I think that was part of the, the message that we had. It wasn't just about the activities in the classroom or in the school building but also happened, what, what happened in the school gate, what happened transporting uh, pupils to schools, but also what parents were doing uh, once their, their children were in school as well. So th there's an ongoing conversation, but I think one of the decisions that the executive has made is to prioritise the education of our young people. There are more um, non-pharmaceutical interventions that have been suggested as to how education can continue in a, a safe and practical manner, and my department engages regularly with the Department of Education to bring forward those and talk about them and discuss them. I call Robbie Butler. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his answers. Um, whilst by no means the only solution, Minister, advances in testing will also play an important role in restricting the transmission of the virus. Uh, can the Minister provide an update on the Northern Ireland's participation in pilots of the new lateral flow tests? Um, I, I think the member I had touched on it earlier this morning. Um, I attended what, will, what is the first uh, initiative here in Northern Ireland, which has been rolled out by Queen's University. Uh, which will see its, its students and its staff uh, tested using the new new devices as well. So that will allow, and it's part of that. I suppose it's part of that program of the the travel corridors, which will allow students uh, to return home for Christmas as well. So while the mass testing may may be part of our solution, it's not the solution, nor should it be seen seen to be. Um, so there is a lot of work still ongoing. Um, and the, in regards to the mass testing of, of, of population, um, it is something that, that we have considered, but we have to make sure that it is the appropriate use um, of those lateral flow devices when we receive them and in regards to the numbers that we receive. But it is part of the, the armoury that we are now building up that will make 2021 a safer place to be. I call to Lord Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement and don't envy his task. But your statement says that it is uh, important to give our people hope. So, Minister, what hope can you and the Executive give to the person who has recently received the devastating diagnosis of cancer and whenever being told by her cancer nurse who had tears in her eyes that no dates could be given to that person for any of their treatment to commence? The, the message um, that I give is one of apology uh, to that individual and many other individuals across our, our, our community where they can't engage with the services that, that they need because we are supporting uh, patients who are coming forward with COVID who need hospitalised due to clinical decision and clinical um, intervention. So the, the, the challenge, and it's, it, it's not one of, of a message of hope because that message would bring little comfort, but the challenge to us all is to drive down the number of infection rates, to break those chains of tr transmission, so that we can successfully reduce the number of inpatients we currently have within our hospital system with COVID, so we can get people like the person you're talking to brought forward to see the specialists that they need to as quickly and as timely as is possible. Hello, Mark Durgan. I thank the Minister for his statement and I commend him on his efforts. I have been inundated over the past few days uh, with concerns about the closure of gyms. The Minister will be well aware of the positive, essential role that exercise plays in the preservation and promotion of individuals' physical and even more so uh, mental health. Could the Minister please explain to the House and to those anxious people uh, the scientific rationale for the recommendation for the closure of gyms that have gone above and beyond to ensure that their premises and practices are sanitised and safe. And again, and again we acknowledge, um, acknowledge the benefits that gyms, gyms do play, but also um, in regards to I suppose, the similarity of a previous answer, uh, through our trace, tra test, trace and protect system, we did see a number of outbreaks uh, associated with gyms. So that's why we have taken the decision and made the recommendation that they too close for the two-week period. And I must stress to members this is, is for a two-week period while we reinforce that key message, that simple message, which is stay at home. So that's the rationale that was taken. So there's little point of a gym being open if the key message is to stay at home. So there's still the availability of outdoor exercise that every, any individual can participate in. But when it comes to what we were seeing through our test trace and protect system as well, gyms were being indicated as a source of infection as well. So the, the steps being taken were, were commendable, are commendable, and, and had broken many a chain of infection. But we were still seeing a number of cases coming through. I call Rachel Woods. And I thank the Minister for coming to the House today. And can I thank all those working in the NHS dealing with the health of our population? As we know, not all heroes wear capes. 
There was mention of an opportunity of a better Christmas, yet over the weekend we heard words from Professor Gabriel Scully, a public health expert at Bristol, on the Prime Minister's pro proposals that there was no point in having a Merry Christmas, only then to bury friends and relations in January and February. There seemed to be some disconnect. So can I ask the Minister when details on Christmas will be issued to the public, and would the Minister support the establishment of an expert task force to increase transparency and to take the politics out of the decision-making around COVID-19? Um, I, I thank the, the member for, for her two questions. In regards to the message around, around Christmas, that is something that is currently being discussed um, with the, the Chan Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, uh, First and Deputy First Minister, uh, First Minister of Scotland, First Minister of Wales, to ensure that there is a consistent approach, but it is also a conversation that involves the Chief Medical Officers as well to make sure that there is not a higher price to pay for what we actually see at Christmas. So I look forward to that work concluding and a joint message coming forward, and one that also includes the, the Government of the Republic of Ireland as well, so there is a consistency across these islands that all families uh, can, can bring forward. In regards to bringing forward that independent task force to, to take over, to take out the politics, um, I know that many individuals are stepping forward and volunteering for it. There is one thing that I always find when it comes to a position like that. Those who volunteer for it may not be the best person to actually do it, because they are already coming with preconceived ideas um, that may not be of benefit, and when they were brought in either to a health service, a health and social care board, or trusts as well, that some of their ideas may not be practical or actually workable. I call Jim Allister. Last week, the Executive Office came to the House and made the statement. This week, the Health Minister has been sent. Is that because the Executive Office want to keep their distance from the unpopular U-turns? and the attack on business. And could I ask the Health Minister, could he reconcile for me the return to lockdown with the fact that this morning on the dashboard it is demonstrably clear that the number of COVID positive tests are now half of what they were six weeks ago, yet we are heading back into lockdown. And as for churches, did he even consult with them? Does he understand, I'm sure he does, the hurt this caused, and will he publish the evidence so that they too can know why they are closed, having tried so hard to do all that was asked of them? Um, I, I, I thank the member um, for, for, for his three questions. In, in, regards to, to, um, in regards to the First and Deputy First Minister not wanting to be here in case they were uh, tagged with an unpopular decision, I think one of the things that has been clear since I took up this post. It is not about trying to be popular. It is about trying to do what I believe is right uh, for the health of the people of Northern Ireland, but also for, for our health care workers. Uh, the member rightly indicates you know, the fall in the number of, of positive cases. Uh, but what I would encourage the member to do well is look on through the dashboard, where he will see the number of inpatients uh, that we currently have in our hospitals um, from COVID-19. And he will see that from the, the 9th of this month that that number has not fallen below 400 um, inpatients. So to put that into perspective, and while those numbers may sound, may sound as simple numbers, um, to put that into perspective, if a member can see in the back of his head an eight-bedded ward, as I am sure he would visit many, many friends or families in hospital, when you picture an eight-bedded ward, Picture 50 of those eight better wards solely supporting COVID patients. And that, I think, demonstrates um, the, the, the challenge that our health service is currently under when, in, in supporting not just COVID patients, but also all those other patients uh, they can support as well. Uh, in regards to, to the decision on churches, as the member rightly indicated, it is not one that, that I, 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 I recommend easily or, or, or are or, or brought forward easily as well. Um, the executive of the junior ministers and chief medical officer, chief scientific advisor, has enga had engaged with the church leaders. Uh, I think after after the decision had been made in regards to what was necessary and why it was necessary. And as indicated, I think the church leaders have made statements, although um, I wouldn't say fully supportive of of the decision that was taken and the challenges that it do, do, does bring. Uh, they also recognise uh, why it was being done in regards to breaking those chains of, of infection.
We call Jerry Carroll. Uh, in a statement, the Minister indicated how mass testing won't be a magic bullet to this crisis as long as com community transmission raises. And I suppose that's true, but it's, it is important that we do have a, a system of mass testing uh, in place. Does the Minister agree with me, therefore, that up until now the Executive utterly failed to implement an uh, adequate testing, adequate track and tracing system when our rate, our, our rate decreased? And can the Minister indicate if any lessons have been learned uh, as we peer into a, a two week uh, circuit breaker? Um, to, to the member's main question, my answer would be no, because we did make um, advances in both our testing capability and the ability of test, trace and protect as well. In regards for lessons being learned, we have now instigated uh, a backward tracing programme where uh, our test, trace and protect individuals will now ask an individual where they have been for the past seven days. So that enhancement has been made. We have also made a number of technological advancements in regards to test, trace and protect as well where those individuals who do test positive can either interact through text messaging or online and providing that additional advice um, as well. So there is a number of steps that have been taken uh, during July and August to make sure those systems were more robust. But in regards to our testing regime, using Pillar 1, Pillar 2, and now our mass testing through the lateral flow, we have an increased test capacity, uh, which is meeting the need uh, that we currently have. And that concludes questions on this statement. Can members please take a raise for a moment or two? Please, thank you.